good morning, good evening, good night. Uh, welcome to the next episode, next edition of Better Place, Talking International Law. Uh, with me, Jonathan Kolib. Uh, I'm locked down, sitting in my lounge room in Melbourne, but uh, through the wonders of technology, we are joined today by an amazing human being, uh, Sarah Holowinski. Uh, she's had an amazing career in international law and international relations. Um, uh, I'd like to say, uh, but maybe we can get into self descriptions later on. Um, and, and has done some really amazing work that I would love to share with this audience. Uh, let me give a, a little brief, uh, a formal bio, Sarah, of you, if that's all right. Go for it. It's, it'll be awkward enough to listen to. There you go. Um, we can count the cringes, all right? Sarah. Sarah Holowinski is uh, the 2020 Jennings Randolph Senior Fellow at the US Institute of Peace. And she's advising the Institute, uh, which by the by is an amazing institute in and of itself, um, on the security sector reform strategy, uh, which hopefully we'll hear a little bit more about. Before that, she was Senior Advisor on Human Rights to the uh, Office of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the US Department of Defense. Uh, prior to that, she was uh, Deputy Chief of Staff to uh, the US uh, Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, under the Obama administration. And prior to that, and I'm sure I'm missing out lots of things in between, uh, she also uh, spearheaded for almost a decade the, uh, a, a, an amazing NGO, non-governmental organization called CIVIC the Center for Civilians in Conflict, where she was the executive director. CIVIC leads efforts to advise warring parties on civilian protection and responsible use of force. Um, and in that role, she worked extensively across uh, many different conflict zones and with different militaries, US militaries and its allies primarily in Afghanistan, Iraq, Israel, Somalia, uh, Central Africa, Burma, and elsewhere. Um, Sarah was a Truman National Security Project Senior Fellow. Uh, she was a member of President Bill Clinton's administration's uh, White House AIDS policy team and has also done some, I think, consulting work for the Clinton Foundation in Africa in, in HIV AIDS uh, awareness uh, as well. Uh, Sarah holds degrees, an undergraduate degree from Georgetown University. I should add at this point, it's a politics degree, I believe. Uh, and a, ma a master's degree in security policy from Columbia. Um, she's a member of Council on Foreign, the US Council on Foreign Relations, and she teaches um, security policy, national security policy, security strategy at Arizona State University and Georgetown University. Um, is, that's the short version, guys. <laughs> Sarah, what did I miss? Um. I, may, I I'm a really good chef actually in my home kitchen and I crochet a lot, especially during lockdown on all these Zooms. Uh, I'm not going to do it here because that'll be boring for your students to see. No, that's fantastic. What are you crocheting? Oh, baby blankets for everyone all over the world. What else are you going to do on Zooms? You can't just stare into the, into the computer for hours a day. I've been stuck on a few really long Zoom webinars, uh, even conferences now on Zoom. It's, yeah. I'll teach you to crochet. It'll, oh, it'll be life changing. <laughs> That'll be good. <laughs> yes, although there's sharp objects involved in crocheting too, so you might. <laughs> um, um, well, that's fantastic. So uh, one of my questions later on, Sarah, was, was tell me something that you're proud of that's not on the CV, but I think you've already ticked that box for us. So that's great. Um, how about this though, Sarah? What's your favorite ice cream flavor? Ooh, I don't like ice cream. <laughs> no, okay. Yeah. We should end, wrap this up now. Um, <laughs> what do you do when you're, when you're peckish, bit of a sweet, you, you know, a sweet tooth, chocolate? No, I don't have a sweet tooth. It's more of a salty thing. So I'll grab a, a you know, a can of olives, but I don't, you know, the whole ice cream thing during summer, like it's refreshing. It's not refreshing it's heavy cream that you're putting into your body it makes you feel lethargic and the sugar right. get it what about an icy pole or what do you call uh, an ice block 
An ice block. Do you mean a popsicle? That's it, a popsicle. I should say, I'm not sure I mentioned. Sarah is joining us from Washington, D.C. Did I say that? Um, I'm a not popsicle. Fine. Fine. Let's go with um, popsicle. A popsicle. Oh, anyway. Um, that's fine. That's the obligatory follow up question for such an amazing um, CV, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so, Sarah, I mentioned, uh, and I made a point of mentioning in, 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 um, when I was recounting your CV, that you don't have a law degree. Um, I do not. And so I'm just curious. So, um, a better place, this, this series is about international law practitioners. Yeah. Does that label sit comfortably with you, or would you describe yourself in a different way? I think, you know, I think none of these labels fit any of us very well, unless you are, you know, I, I certainly worked with a lot of lawyers at the Pentagon, for example, who like, that's what they did. They were in the office of general counsel and what they did every single day was, you know, parse through particular policies to make sure it was in accordance with IHL, um, international humanitarian law. I don't know. I think I certainly used the law a lot, but when I was getting a degree, I, I considered, you know, do I get a master's degree? Do I get a law degree? What I wanted to do, because I was working at Human Rights Watch at the time while I was getting my master's degree in New York, um, I was seeing all of this work that these amazing human rights advocates were doing on genocide and mass atrocities. And, and I thought, you know, that's what I want to do. Mm. But I want to be able to sit down across from a three-star general and tell him why I think he should care about human rights. And the way to do that was not to get a human rights degree because any of us can read the declaration and see what that's about. And the way to do that was not to get a law degree because I just need to throw in some Latin words and he'll think that I know what I'm <laughs> talking about anyway. The way to do that is to get a security policy degree. And so I spent my two years of my master's, you know, reading about war and Clausewitz and, you know, how troops move and the history of war so that I could, you know, convincingly talk about his strategy and why human rights fit into that. But I certainly, um, you know, international law is the is the basis, supposed to be the basis for how the United States goes about using force. And so I certainly used the law and would have been lost without knowing it. Yeah, so that's really interesting. So um, how did, so you just picked it up, your knowledge of the law, I mean, it's a little bit more, and your knowledge of the law is a little bit more than just reading Declaration of Human Rights. So, so you just picked it up along the way? I mean, you're self-taught? I'm, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, I, I don't think like a lawyer. So I, I feel like going to law school and you, you know, you can tell me differently, but going to law school is about how, how you think as much as what it is that you think. And so I got the what without the how. Um, so I don't think like a lawyer. I don't write like a lawyer. I don't analyze things like a lawyer or parse things like a lawyer, but I, worked a lot with judge advocates general, um, which are the lawyers for the US military. And I, you know, it's in working in civilian protection, which I did for so long, um, it's a fairly narrow slice of even international humanitarian law, civilian protection is a fair, fairly narrow slice. You know, it wasn't necessarily created to protect civilians in the first place anyway. Right. So what I needed to learn was really how the military thought about those laws um, and then how policies would then take those legal principles and apply them. So uh, for me, a lot of it was policy. Understanding the basis, the legal basis was important, but it was really about applying the policy on top of it. Right. So, so maybe not even an international law practitioner, but the way I describe, uh, I'm hearing you describe your own sort of life's work is international law advocate to the yeah. security sector writ large. Yeah. Would that, yeah, really interesting. Yeah, and not even necessarily the law, but the principles that inspired the law. And I don't know how you sort of categorize that in a career, but it's really, you know, I don't necessarily, I can't rattle off what the third Geneva Convention is, but I understand oh, what it is. was created. 
and I understand what the principles are behind it and why the United States or other governments would want to live up to those mm. for legitimacy reasons or strategic reasons. Um, and that's sort of what I hung my hat on in my career. Right. That's really interesting. I'm going to try and circle back to some of that um, in a second. Um, so it's, yeah, so this is a, a, a non-lawyer engaging in a very meaningful, practical manner with international law um, mm -hmm. and, and law principles and, and, and policies that come out of it. I'm just curious to step back for a second. What is international law when I say that to you? Three words to describe international law? Yeah. Well, I guess it's the framework for using force. Um, that's how I think about it. That is the way in which I've used it is, you know, here's, you want to use force. Here's the box right. that you have to fit into. And then within that box, it's like a bunch of, let me mix my metaphors. It's like a bunch of electrons and atoms, you know, bouncing around. It's like all these different things and ways in which they can form different molecules. And so, um, you know, it's not necessarily a plug and play or pick your own adventure, but it's certainly, uh, you know, different states look at those different things in different ways. Yeah. But I also saw a lot of what was missing in international humanitarian law, and that's what I worked on. So, for example, um, I worked a lot on trying to get compensation for civilians who'd been harmed by U.S. bullets and bombs. Um, that is not anywhere in international law. That, that not even compensation, not even monetary compensation, but that you would have to recognize or dignify the people that you'd harmed that were just collateral damage. That you don't have to list them anywhere. You don't need to know their names. You don't need to know about their history or their family. You don't have to make sure that you pay for the house that you just destroyed nowhere in the law. So, so that's where the principles of of international humanitarian law, like can turn into policy even by skipping the step of becoming law. Mm. And I have to um, change the outlet that my computer's plugged into because I'm gonna lose you. I didn't realize this oh. one wasn't working. That's okay. Um, I will sing a tune in the meantime. It, um, sing us a song, you're the piano man. Okay, no, yeah. stop that. Okay, okay, <laughs> stop. Um, no, that's really interesting. I think, um, so to, to merge a little, uh, two, two of your roles, I think Sam Power, your, your, your old uh, boss at uh, the US mission at the United Nations, Sam Power, who's a bit of a rock star when it comes to uh, interna international law, international law advocacy, protection of civilians. Um, I think she uh, is quoted as saying about Civic, your, uh, your previous job before you worked with Sam, that uh, Civic's job was uh, was putting an end to the use of one of the most unfortunate terms in the English language, collateral damage. Yeah. And I just thought that really encapsulated so much of didn't Civic's even work. She had said that. Um, I do my research. No, that's it. Actually, that's the extent of my research for the interview. Um, but I just thought that really captured it, right? Because collateral damage also sort of is, is the jargon of the security sector that you're engaging. And, and, and as you were just talking, it's not, international law is not just about law and rules. It's also about values and principles. Yes. And, and that's kind of what that quote gets at. Yes, and this is, this is one of the arguments that I was always making um, inside the Pentagon. So I was working for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs and, and for Aussies, the, the chairman, so the Pentagon is, you can split it up into two pieces. One is the civilian sort of oversight um, policy function, and that's the Secretary of Defense. The military side is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and that's, you know, he's basically the senior most military officer for the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard, um, all the branches of the military. And being on that side, side of things as a human rights advocate was was fascinating and one of the things that I found myself consistently arguing and I was surprised that I needed to argue it because I thought it was so obvious after all these years of doing civilian protection is that um, one of the things I found myself arguing what were we talking about uh, ah. 
<laughs> that that the the it is the so especially with the public affairs people, they would say, okay, there's this allegation that we caused civilian casualties in a province in Afghanistan. We don't need to say anything about that. We don't believe that we did it, yada, 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 right? It was always this knee-jerk reaction of like, we didn't cause that harm. Um, and the thing that they were consistently missing is that a lot of international law is about those values and principles that underpin it, which is dignity for human life, recognition of harm and your own use of force and what, what ramifications that has, legitimacy as a fighting power, um, and all of those things form, come together to form American values. So if you know anything about American values, it's all about humanity, you know, humanity in times of the most terrible circumstances. And, you know, we live up to bigger and better ideals. That's what makes us not the Taliban or not ISIS because we believe different things. And so, all right, if you believe different things and you are better and you want to stand on higher moral ground, then you can't just ignore civilian harm or the ramifications of what you do in Raqqa. If humanitarians are calling Raqqa a pancake after you've been there, that's not living up to our values. Um, it's interesting. I, 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 I want a complete tangent, but I'm curious. Um, IHL, International Humanitarian Law, in the principles you mentioned, your first one was humanity, I think. When you sit back, though, and reflect, there's one cri criti crit criticism of IHL is it actually legitimizes warfare. Hmm. That international law is actually the enabler, the facilitator that allows the bloodshed in the first place. And wouldn't a better international law simply be an outright ban on hostilities, on war, on conflict? I was wondering if you ever sort of, well, if you have any sort of reflections on that. Would that we could live in that kind of world, Jonathan Colin. Uh It's just impossible. It's just, you know, the, all of us who, who consider ourselves at least partial idealists hmm. have to be realist in some way that, you know, states will fight, non-state armed groups will fight. They will get weapons they will cause bloodshed, they will use force. So, the, you know, if we didn't have international law, um, we'd have to create it. But that's the, you know, that's the thing about international. It's like, you have to have some sort of framework, some sort of rules of the game, because that game will be played. There's no way that it's not gonna be played. And it's the same thing with the United Nations. Like if we wanted to, it's so ineffective, right? But if we were to scrap the United Nations, we'd have to build the United Nations because you need a place to dialogue with people. Wow. You know, there are always improvements that can be made, but the, but I think these international humanitarian laws, one of the, the great accomplishments of humans. And not without its flaws and, and not that it can't be improved, but um, a, a, a beautiful statement there. Um, if I may take you back, um, not to high school, uh, you, you already mentioned sort of your time working at Human Rights Watch whilst you were yeah. getting your master's degree was sort of your light bulb moment uh, as to sort of getting into this sort of space. Uh, happy for you to elaborate on that if you want, but I was actually going to ask what actually, what was your big break to get into? Like what was your first gig and how did you get that? So it's, it's one thing to work at intern or part-time at, at Human Rights Watch over the summer or, or whatever it was versus actually turning that into a career. So what was that, that first big stepping stone for you? Yeah, I mean, I, we, we actually do have to go back pretty much to high school because I, um, got, I got an internship at the White House under President Clinton to work in his AIDS policy office. He had an HIV AIDS policy office. Um, but I was 19, I had just turned 19 the week before. And I got up to DC and after working the summer there, they asked me to stay on as staff. And, and I did, I quit college um, and stayed there. And, oh, wow. and after that, 
you know, my boss who was wonderful said, we want you to stay through the entire second Clinton term, but you have to get a degree. And so I went to Georgetown at the same time as working at the White House. I was sleeping on the White House sofa because I had to do, you know, my finals and my papers. You can do that when you're 20 years old. <laughs> um, <laughs> Even in the Clinton uh, White House. Uh, yes. And so, so even, you know, even at that young age, I was getting exposure to what Washington was about and, uh, and wanting, I, ha I had been pre-med, I wanted to be a doctor and I realized, oh, I could do policy and change millions of lives instead of just one. You know, that's what we think policy is actually going, like career and policy is actually going to be. Right. Um, and so that's, that's really where it started. And then, and then um, it really didn't matter the issue at that point. It was like, I just want to, as long as it's a good cause, I want to be an advocate. Um, okay. And it was, but, but going to Human Rights Watch really made me fall in love with war, which is such a weird thing to say, but it's, war is just that, it's like the best and worst of what humans can do to each other. Mm. And it's so intense. And that's, um, I think that's what I was drawn to. Right. And, and how, did get, right, how did I get into that? Yeah. It's like, yeah. So I was at Human Rights Watch um, as, a, as a consultant. I was a writer there. And so I got to, I was exposed to all of these different issues. And there was a young woman there named Marla Ruzica, who was my same age. We were at 20, 27, 28. And she had formed her own organization called Civic. And she didn't have any money. She didn't have a staff. She didn't have a strategy. She just cared so much about civilians in Iraq and Afghanistan who were being harmed by the United States military. And so Human Rights Watch gave her a free office. And I met her briefly. And a few months later, I, there was this news that came in that she had been killed in Iraq um, on Airport Road, which was an extremely dangerous road at the time. This was 2005 by a suicide bomber. Um, and I, you know, I knew some of the board of directors and they came back to me about six months later as I was graduating and said, do you want to, you want to try your hand at running this organization? Mm. You've got no staff, you've got no budget and there's no strategy, but we think it's a really good idea. Yeah. <laughs> so there yeah. it was. And 10 years later, you've made, you, you may, you, you left civic in a really good state. You're one of the preeminent or if not the preeminent civilian protection organizations on the planet. Um, you told me before well, the interview. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a really good idea. You're working in, in dozens of countries and, and you put it on a sustainable footing. So you're not only an international law practitioner, you're also a, a manager of staff, a, a fundraiser. You, you, you wore many hats during that time at Civic. Yeah, communication staff. I mean, it was, you know, I would uh, on one day be writing proposals to foundations and begging for money and the next day be standing in Mogadishu with the, you know, Amazon forces commander trying to convince him to track civilian casualties. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what an experience. I wouldn't give it yeah. up for anything. That's amazing. And, and so much of that was obviously, you know, that old catch all uh, chestnut, you know, being in the right place at the right time. But it's, I think about putting yourself in that right place and being there at the right time, wasn't it? And being yeah. willing to take that leap, um, right? Like, yeah. it's so crazy to be 28 and taking over an organization when you didn't even know, Right. That, you know, civilian casualties formally meant deaths and injuries. Right. And, <laughs> and, and that might be right. on the job. Like, <laughs> and immediately after Marla's uh, tragic, tragic loss as well, so. Yes, yeah. you got to take the risk. Yeah. Um, amazing. So, so let's flash forward to Sam Power and the UN. Uh, I'm not sure how many years, you, it was a few years, I believe you worked uh, as, as Deputy Chief of Staff to, to Sam Power. It was over a year, but less than two. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, I'm curious, so your general impressions of the UN? Um, yeah. I mean, that was fascinating because I got to know, I mean, this is, so as a general matter, um, I feel like whatever job you do, you should be learning. You should be learning skills. You should be learning, so, like, don't take a job where you, you know everything. That, God, how boring. 
I sort of think of myself as like, and, and all of us as like puzzles and we are, we're made up of all these different pieces and I want to stick more onto me, right? I want more puzzle pieces. And the thing about USUN was that I got to know it, it is a function of the State Department because it is a formal mission, sort of like an embassy to a country, but it's to the United Nations. So I was part of the State Department and got to see that whole Michigas <laughs> and and also got to see the craziness of the United Nations. And, and that was pretty amazing. The thing is, yes, the United Nations seems like it's not doing much in the world. The thing is, we don't hear about it much because the successes are, they're incremental, they're iterative, and they happen without big fireworks. But the UN is holding actually so much together, even if it is just that it is the place where states can come and talk to each other, you don't really have that anywhere else. And, and that in and of itself is a diffuser of conflict and tension. It is a place where negotiations can be carried out. And so, um, yeah, I mean, that's why I say, I think if we didn't have the UN, we'd have to create it. Yeah. I think it's really important. And, and that's just the, the, the diplomacy and, and the lawmaking also programmatically, I think uh, they play an essential service uh, in our world today. Uh, but it's not about my opinions, it's about yours uh, today. No, that's that's um, absolutely right, and especially during a time, I was there during, um, so th that summer that I, that I joined, 2014, there was uh, little green men in Ukraine. There was basically Russia invading Ukraine, taking over Crimea. Um, there was, oh, the, uh, even more bloodshed in Gaza. That was terrible. There was Ebola. Uh, that started and we we took a trip to West Africa and and Samantha Power tried to to manage that and did a remarkable job. Um, Syria was ongoing and of course Samantha Power was trying very hard within the administration to get President Obama to to take action. So there was all of this stuff happening. Um, it was a really intense time. Mm. Um, and during your time at the UN, so maybe it didn't make the headlines, but I'm curious, was there, what was like the, the trickiest international law issue you had to deal with, big or small, with, mm. and without betraying any confidences or obviously? Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. I learned a lot from the lawyers there. They were pretty remarkable. Um, you know, Syria obviously was one of the, yeah. the big ones. Unsolved and, too, yeah unsolved and international law issues like is it justified to take action hmm. if we do take action what can that look like against a sovereign country you know going back to responsibility to protect which you and i um have been talking about for over a decade together <laughs> but those were you know that was really tricky stuff the the russia invading ukraine also a very tricky international law issue mm. and what are the tools that a country like the United States can use we had just been a couple years before through the Libya invasion which was supposed to be about protecting civilians became regime change the global community was not up for another one of those yes. um, and, so, and an invocation of formal invocation of responsibility to protect too was it not? Yeah. Right. Yes. Libya. Right. The last we had. Right. First and last. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, I'm doing a bit too much editorializing. <laughs> no, I love it. This is a great conversation. I mean, this is what you know. It's unfortunate that that R2P responsibility to protect was tried in Libya and went too far, and there was nobody. You know, it seemed like there was nobody kind of at the wheel saying, no, this is a really important principle and we've got to get it right. Right. It was I, like, we, now we need to get rid of Gaddafi. It goes back, I think, so much international law is, is fragile. And it goes back to Tom Frank's um, great US scholar of international law, legitimacy. And we need to protect these principles and doctrines and ideas, um, lest they be misused. 
Yes, that's, that's exactly right. And I think not enough, this is, so this is what happens, I think, when the people in charge are not paying attention enough to international law and not being guardians of it. They are distracted by other priorities that seem to be taking precedence. And this is why the International Committee for the Red Cross is so important. You know, groups like that, that uh, while they have their flaws, are meant to protect and hold those principles and values and legal you know, legal remits. Right. I'm, 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 co I'm conscious of time. So I, I did, and I did want to sort of give you another opportunity to touch back on this, on this amazing um, moment in your career where you were talking international law, international humanitarian values to folks in uniform, the most senior leadership of the US yeah. military. Um, was that your proudest career accomplishment? Yeah. Now that you mention it, I, I guess I haven't thought about my proudest career accomplishment, but that it was a position that I created, um, which is, is not in my bio. There is no human rights advisor to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs. There's plenty of lawyers, uh, military lawyers, but there is, not, um, there is not somebody in his office who is saying, wait, you want to do biometrics on what border for refugees? Or you want to you want to use that weapon, th you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so my human rights community had always wanted somebody with, with our kind of background inside the military, inside that belly of the beast. And uh, when I left Samantha Power's office, I said, you know, this is kind of the time to do it. General Joseph Dunford was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, a four-star general very reasonable, really, really all about American values. And so I made the pitch to him and he said, yeah, great, let's have a human rights advisor, but we don't have a billet for it, which means we don't have money, we don't have a slot, that's never been done before. So if you can get it created, great. So it took me two years to get funding. I had to find a think tank, a research organization here in DC to house me and then second me over there and i had to get a security clearance which i then did through another research organ it was crazy um right. but it worked and, and is there still years there is there still an office there today a human rights advisor to the joint chiefs that was the goal of this whole thing was to make it permanent and to set precedent um and the bureaucracy would just not allow for a permanent position and i'm still working on it i'm gonna get it done but now there's a new chairman you know it but what a remarkable time i started two weeks before president trump did yeah. um and two weeks after finding out that i was pregnant with my with my daughter so it was this crazy time in which i was the uh there were two of us two female civilians in, in an office of all male military yeah. We were both pregnant um, and it was the best professional experience I've ever had. I loved working with the military because they have a culture of listening. Mm. They may not agree, they may not actually take my advice and do what I'm saying, but they will listen and they will think deeply about it. Yeah. And 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 there was a value add for this position that the JAG Corps or military lawyers were not fulfilling at, before you? Yeah, because, you know, they, they, a judge advocate will talk about a particular operation or, or an O plan, like a, a massive, it's called an operational plan for a place like Mosul. Um, and then the particular, you know, strikes that judge advocates will talk about those things and whether they abide by international humanitarian law, but they will not talk about whether it improves or harms US legitimacy to do a certain thing in Mosul or whether um, the displacement plan with the United Nations that the US and Iraq were trying to figure out for Mosul civilians who were fleeing 
what are the benefits and the cons and is it going too slowly and should you put you know should you start operations before that's in place and you know those kinds of things are um i don't know if you would call them policy but it was really about u.s strategy legitimacy and then i would sort of piggyback on to the judge advocates and the law that they were you know mm. espousing and, and and advising on fascinating um and i have faith that you will um restore the uh restore the role sooner rather than later absolutely it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen. um well you should be very proud that sounds like a, an amazing um achievement uh, were you there during president trump launched uh, an airstrike uh, on syria after a chemical weapons attack um yeah. were you uh, are you able to share any uh, reflections of that time or I mean, that's the thing with President Trump is that it, ha you know, it happens and you don't necessarily know that it's going to happen. Um, not a lot of process, not a lot of planning necessarily. I mean, you know, if you look at even just the open source stuff, meaning the media has has covered these things. Sometimes even the military itself doesn't know that this stuff is going to happen. Um, I was also there when when he uh, dropped the Moab, the mother of all bombs uh on afghanistan and that was that was pretty remarkable too yeah mm. let's not go down this uh this trump rabbit hole um at least yeah well not till after the recording stops um and i do i, I want to shift to where you are now you're at u.s institute of peace in australia we don't have uh, a u.s uh, an australian institute of peace um uh happy for you to wax lyrical a little bit about your organization if you want but i'm actually curious what are you working on right now like uh w w when we turn this off what's on your agenda for for today or this week yeah so i'm a senior fellow there um which is a really fun gig because you get to wax poetic about all of these things you know philosophical about all of these things um and i'm i'm specifically looking at security sectors and how security sectors around the world right now are responding to to covid which is really interesting because so many states coming out of conflict have including because of u.s assistance have funded invested so much money in their militaries and in their police but not in their health sectors not in building up the things that actually need to respond to covid so what we're seeing around the world is a very militarized response to a public health crisis. Mm. And many states, even if they're, many states who are already predisposed to authoritarianism uh, are fast going down that route with the lockdowns, with the police brutality, with censorship, lack of freedom of assembly you know under the guise of this is a public health response and then some states that were not necessarily going down the authoritarian pathway are now starting to because the i think the power in that is is really intoxicating to quite a lot of leaders yeah. so this is what we're seeing um and that's what i'm tracking mm. and and right um well that's a heavy workload um and and so that's not per se on international law or do you see is there a i mean this is that's more domestic country by country i'm just curious is is there an international law connection to that slide to authoritarianism or slide to authoritarian practices that yeah i would say that there's international principles but not necessarily law um mm -hmm. that i know about except that you know it's not necessarily international humanitarian law international human rights law of course applies to these situations and we're seeing a lot of human rights abuses violations um there's also you know my big concern right now that that i'm not seeing a lot of people talk about is if you want to if you want to create a mass atrocity if you want to wipe out a population now's the time to do it because nobody's going to intervene you know r2p or not you know, even the United States peacekeepers, or they're going to go in with masks. No, mm. nobody's going to do anything. And well, so I yeah. really fear that, and the reporting, you know, people can't get to certain places. I just think we're going to see a lot of, of terrible mass yeah. atrocities. Or, or not see, but hear about it in a year or two. Well, Maybe Yemen, the war in Yemen is, 
and unfortunately sliding from bad to worse and many others as well. Um, really interesting. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm conscious of time. I, I have a bunch of fun sort of questions. Uh, we could talk for hours, Sarah. Um, uh, I've got a bunch of fun questions, but I did want to just ask a, a one last serious one, I, I think. Um, presidential politics. The whole world is absolutely enthralled by US presidential politics. And you happen to be the human rights advisor for a US presidential candidate, Pete Buttigieg, uh, from the mayor of South Bend, Indiana. Um, yeah. young, uh, was he 30 when he started or 32? When he, he was uh, 37, actually. 37, excuse me. Old man. Old man. Um, and the first uh, publicly declared uh, gay candidate for yeah. the US presidency. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so groundbreaking in his own right. Um, what was that like? But more importantly, I'm just wondering from that perch where you, you know, uh, involved in those, in that high level politics, do you think America in this, the post Trump era will sort of regain its leadership in international lawmaking and, and, and the championing of international law? And what will, what will it take? Yeah, I mean, the number, <laughs> the number of memos that all of the staff of these presidential campaigns have, have produced on reclaiming our legitimacy in the world, including through international law. I mean, they could, fi they could fill binders. Mm. We're all concerned with that. We, we, what's it going to take? I mean, it's going to take rebuilding our State Department. It's going to take actually informing Americans about what international law is and why foreign policy needs to include it. It's going to take, you know, telling them what human rights are. We, we have lost so much over, and, and it's not just President Trump, we've lost so much over the past decades of American understanding of the rest of the world and, and how we engage in the rest of the world and certainly international law and human rights. So um, it's gonna take a lot. If we, those of us who do not want President Trump to be president in November, if we are successful in January. gaining back the White House, uh, right, so the election's November, um, a new president will come in in January. And if we're touch, successful- Touch wood, touch wood. Yeah, it's gonna take a lot, a lot, a lot of work. If President Trump is president for the next four years, um, I, I don't know that we'll regain that. Mm. Mm -hmm. because so much will be broken. Um, but what a, what a fantastic time to be with Pete Buttigieg on the campaign, you know, yeah. re really thoughtful about mass atrocities and what our human rights policy should be. And, you know, re just really, really wonderful guy. And, and, uh, and hopefully Vice President Biden, you know, I know that he shares the same values about recouping what we've lost on international law. Yeah. And, and Pete was ex-military officer, uh, yeah. wasn't he as well? Yeah, yeah. so um, can speak from a personal experience as well, which is always valuable. Um, all right, uh, let's shift gears a little. Your favorite, Sarah, your favorite international law moment? Oh, yeah. Okay, wait, in history or my own career? Uh, I was thinking history, but you can go career if you want. I okay. Thinking, go, go on. I'm going to go my own career because okay. all of your viewers know about the international law history and there's probably like these really great moments that I'm not even thinking about. I lobbied, advocated for civilians to receive help after being harmed by NATO for years in Kabul with ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force and at NATO proper um, in Brussels, years. I would go state to state, all of the offices and say, because you can't actually have like a NATO policy unless all of the states say yes. So it was like, Spain, here's why you should care. Italy, Australia. Um, and finally, so this is, this is one lesson for your viewers. If you want something done, you have to do it yourself. Meaning um, there was no law or policy on the books for NATO to help civilians who were harmed. And so we wrote one because they're not going to do that. They don't, you know, so we wrote it, we distributed it to everyone. And then at the next legislative session that they had, uh, I was asked to introduce 
what this sort of bill was, this legislation to help civilians who'd been harmed. All the states were around the table. It was like the UN. And then they asked me to leave and they voted on it. They actually voted yes. <laughs> and a new policy was created to help civilians who were harmed. And it was underpinned by, there was a lot of international law in there, underpinned by, by international law. And that was pretty cool. That is very cool. Um, uh, that is very cool. Uh, favorite historical international law moment, if anything comes to mind. Otherwise, we can move on. Nah, maybe when international law was sort of <laughs> eschewed by the US coalition working in Libya, because I think it's not favorite, but I think so, so, so pivotal. And I think we're going to look back at that time and think yeah. that's when something really changed. Interesting. Um, favorite international law book? Oh, uh, I, okay. I don't know if it's a formal, see, because I'm not a lawyer, but Killing Civilians by Hugo Slim uh, walks through the seven ways in which civilians are harmed in in armed conflict and it is brilliant it's so it's underpinned by international law a lot of international law in there but uh it's really meant for people like me who need to understand but are not lawyers no no uh, yeah uh, everyone should read it awesome uh, and favorite movie about international law yeah <laughs> um I guess Steel Magnolias does not have international law in it. Oh, do you know, I've never seen all that. Australian, all Australians should watch it. It's just so good. Is that right? <laughs> That's a Julia Roberts. Is Julia Roberts in that still? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's from the 80s. Right, right. Pretty Woman is one of my favorite all time movies. Um, also, not international law. Uh, well, anyway, human trafficking. I'm sure you could, we could write an international lecture about based on yes. Pretty Woman. Um, I, did, I saw Outpost, which is about the US military unit that was in Afghanistan and sort of based because of COIN, because of counterinsurgency, where they were supposed to be winning hearts and minds with the local elders. They were put in this valley with mountains up all around them the worst military decision ever. And it is about their time in this place being attacked by the Taliban constantly and the big fight that happens. Um, mm. And it's all true and it's remarkable. The outpost. Okay. Yeah. Uh, these are great recommendations. Um, I, I was gonna ask you um, advice for students of international law if they wanna follow in your footsteps. Um, but how about this? How about we ask it like this, in retrospect, what would you have liked someone to have told you when you were at university? Oh, that it's about skills. Like pack in that knowledge, excellent. Know about the law, know about, you know, the declarations and the conventions and the, know all of that, but you need to know how to write. You need to know what a budget is. You need to know what management and leadership look like. You need to know logistics. I mean, if you actually want to accomplish something in the world, um, Again, as I say, you've got to do it yourself because people are not going to do it for you. And if you want to advocate for some good cause, hopefully your students would advocate for good causes. Um, you got to do that spade work. You've got to do the grunt work. So know how to do it um, and, and know how like know how to make an argument, know how to write a bullet pointed briefing memo. You know, this it sounds so silly, but yeah, and that's, that. and that's actually what you're teaching at Georgetown. Is that right? Yeah. At, at ASU. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's really valuable sort of the communication skills and the practical management skills, I think are really important to learn. Um, I fantastic. still freak out when I see an Excel spreadsheet with a budget in it, I still do, but you got to know how to do it because everything that you want to do requires funding too. So mm -hmm. all of that, all those skills are so important. Okay. Two final questions, Sarah. International law is fill in the blank is one of the it, it is the tattoo that I would get if the Geneva Conventions weren't so long <laughs> uh, and um, 
And uh, the fi my final question, you've traveled so many places around the world by dint of your work, been to many different dozens of countries. Um, any, do any stand out to you? And when the hell are you coming down under? <laughs> I, you know, I keep wanting to, and uh, Professor Oswald was trying to get me down there um, to, to teach a seminar. So as soon as this COVID thing is over, I will be there. But I, God, I miss traveling so much. And mm. I didn't even, you know, I kept waiting for war to break out in like Fiji or somewhere really great. But it was always, you know, Mogadishu and Afghanistan and Iraq, which actually I have really come to appreciate the beauty of those places and the, the overlay of sadness when you see all of the bombed out buildings and the, just the devastation. But there's still, there's still a lot of beauty there. And I, I really miss seeing them. Mm, that's beautiful. And uh, sorry, I have uh, one final, final question because you just triggered something. So what does give you hope? What, what, what makes you be able to acknowledge all that suffering um, and the sadness and yet still have that smile and, and see those glimmers of, uh, I'm not sure if it's hope or happiness, or, but, but, but that put a smile on your face just now and, and that keeps you going. I guess, well, two things. One is very Whitney Houston of me. It's the next generation, you know. I believe the children are our future. That, you know, the people that we are talking to right now, they come in with so much passion for this stuff. And even when I'm tired and cynical and just think, oh, does any of this matter? And then I see somebody who's going to university and who just can't wait to get out there and write that memo and talk to that general. And, to, you know, that is really remarkable. And I, and I, I love just stepping aside and, and seeing them go. Um, and then the other thing is that this is actually something that Elizabeth Gilbert wrote about sort of oddly in Eat, Pray, Love, which is, you know, you can, you can be on a refugee boat fleeing Sri Lanka and the women might be talking about, you know, their boyfriends, you know, or, or there's, a, there's this story that I tell about a, an aid shipment that was going to a war zone and it was being dropped uh, from a plane in a, in a big box and it was supposed to be like lentils or something really useful and it turned out to be lipstick and instead of <laughs> instead of being so sad the women were like oh, yeah. <laughs> because it was this little moment of dignity you know they they were human again they were they got to enjoy something frivolous that made them just feel better instead of just surviving. Mm. And I just feel like those two examples, it's like people are going to be people and they go through this horrendous experience. And yes, they are bruised and damaged and broken, but we can all recover and still find those little moments of dignity. And, and that is very helpful to keep in mind. Mm. That's beautiful. Um, way to end and wrap up uh, the interview, Sarah. Sarah Holowinski, uh, Jennings Randolph, Senior Fellow at the US Institute of Peace, and so much more. Um, thank you, thank you for the interview. Thank you, thank you for making the world a better place. <laughs> um, My pleasure, so nice to see you again. Nice to see you too, um, take care. <laughs>